Our text this morning is from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, starting at verse 14 and finishing the chapter. And now, indeed, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So he took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also his enemy shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Then he looked on Amalek and he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Then he looked on the Kenites and took up his oracle and said, Firm is your dwelling place, and your nest is in the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned. How long until Asher carries you away captive? Then he took up his oracle and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from the coast of Cyprus, and they shall afflict Asher and afflict Eber, and so shall Amalek until he perishes. So Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to a holiday that culminates with gift giving, may we first have our hearts and minds oriented to the greatest gift of all. Please fix our eyes on Christ, and may everything else in our life be oriented to that one firm and certain fixed point. And would you please use our study of your word now in making clear to us the reality and centrality of Jesus Christ. We pray these things now in your Son's name, and amen. So we're now in the fourth prophecy of Balaam, and it's at this prophecy that we, we start to see how it is that this series of, of, we've done three prophecies from Balaam already, this is the fourth and the final one, and it's in this fourth and final one that we see why it is that this is an Advent series. The earlier ones, you might wonder, what does this have to do with Christmas? But we see it culminate in what's clearly an Advent message, and it's right there in verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. This is the star, the star of Bethlehem. It's finally fulfilled in, in Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So this, this prophecy in Numbers 24, finally finds its fulfillment in Matthew 2, the star that leads the wise men from the east to Jerusalem, announcing that, that a king has been born in Israel, leading them to Jerusalem, inquiring of Herod, and then from there in on to Bethlehem and taking them to uh, baby Jesus in the manger, where they bring the gifts to him and recognize him as the king that has been announced by uh, this star. Um, this star is an ever-present symbol for our celebration of Christmas. It's on top of many of your Christmas trees, right? It's on the front of the Christmas cards that you send to everyone. That star is a really important symbol for the celebration of Christmas. And here in Balaam's fourth prophecy, we find out why it is that this star is a symbol of Christmas. Now, we look back to, to this section here. Remember that, that three times in a row, looking back over the past three prophecies of Balaam, three times in a row, the curse that Balak sought to get against Israel from Balaam, he's trying to hire him to, to cast a, a spell to curse Israel. And three times in a row, this curse that Balak sought to get against Israel has backfired and has become a curse against Balak himself and against Balak's uh, nation of Moab. It's a bit of poetic justice that we should come to expect of God. This is something that he tends to do again and again. We have uh, David in the Psalms multiple, multiple times praying that, that what God's enemies are plotting 
for God's people that God would flip it on them and have them fall into the traps that they themselves have set. You think of Psalm 141, uh, verse 10. David prays, let the wicked fall into their own nets. So you, you set up a trap for someone, and if you're doing it to God's people, God works it so that trap becomes a thing that you fall into. And it happens again and again. Uh, you think of, of Haman, who, who sees Mordecai, hates him, sets up the gallows that he intends to hang uh, Mordecai on, and then God works it so that Haman himself is hung on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. And if you think about it for a moment, it's kind of like a flipping of the golden rule or, or, or the flip side of the golden rule, maybe I should say. So it's, it's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But in this, you have what, what you would have done unto others will be done unto you. What you would have done unto others, that's going to be done unto you. And it, it's built into the Old Testament law. I think of uh, Deuteronomy 19. There you see the, the penalty that you're supposed to... Um, uh, have on, on somebody who, who uh, gives a false witness, attempting to get somebody convicted of a crime that this person knows they didn't do, but they want to see them go down. So they lie in court to get somebody in trouble. Um, starting verse 16. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing. So you're going to court to swear that this person did something and you know they didn't do it, but you're going to lie because you want to see them go down. Then here's the penalty when that's discovered. And the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. If it was a death penalty that this person would have suffered, then you're going to be executed because you were trying to murder them using the court system. So what you would have done unto others is going to be done uh, unto you. Uh, so it's, it's built into to the law, and I think Balak has experienced this three times in a row. He's trying to curse Israel, and it keeps boomerang, boomeranging back and, and, and getting him instead. And Balaam is seeing the futility of this, and he knows we, we, can't, we can't keep at this. We're not, we're not getting this done. And so he can't curse Israel. And since he can't curse Israel, he's trying to think of what he can do. And so the best that he can do is he can give Bala, Balak a prophecy of what's going to happen in, uh, down, down the line in, in future years. So he's going to give um, Balak a, a prophecy to show him what will happen. And so he, he falls into a trance again, uh, and uh, you see that in, in verses 15 and 16. It's the same thing that happened in verses 3 and 4. So you remember in, in the third prophecy, he doesn't do it like he did the first two times, and he, he falls into a trance, and he's just sort of revealing what God is showing to him. And he repeats the same beginning, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God. And then this part is different. He adds this, and has the knowledge of the Most High who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. He's, he's, uh, he's underlining the fact that he knows what he's receiving is not just from any random you know, Canaanite god. He is re receiving a vision from the Most High, from the God of all, from Yahweh, the God who is the God, uh, Most High God over all. And, and he's revealing this vision now to Balak. So he, um, he, he reveals to him, and um, once more, he's revealing what God has shown him, not any God, but the most high God over all. And what he sees in this vision is this, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A scepter, or a star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. He sees one rising up in Israel in this vision. He, he, sees, he sees Israel. Remember last time he, he saw all the tents of Israel. He sees them all laid out. And as he's looking at them now, he sees one rising up out of Israel. And this, this one that he sees rising up out of Israel, he describes him as a star. He sees, he sees a star. And then he sees a scepter. Uh, rising up out of Israel. And while this star will rise, as, as this one is rising up, the rest of the nations that are all around, um, that, that had up till this point seemed to loom so large, 
so terrifying. Remember, this is Israel in the wilderness. They're coming into the promised land that God has given them. They see this land, and they see the people that are in this land. They're terrified by this people. There's all these nations that are in this, this area that, that God says, We're, I'm giving to you. And there are all these nations. But, but Balaam is looking, and he's seeing all of these nations that terrified the Israelites. But as the scepter rises, as the star rises, he sees all of them fall away. He sees all of them conquered, crumble, and fall apart as this scepter comes up. And what's interesting is you go through this list of nations here, and, um, and what's weird is how um, little we know now of these nations. This list is a really kind of cryptic list because many of them perish so quickly that very little is preserved about them. We don't know much about them. And even though they loomed large for Israel, as they saw the land that they were about to take and, and saw these nations that surrounded them and the, ter the terror of these nations, and they, they felt insignificant in the eyes of these nations, that there's this great threat that these people would overwhelm Israel. And yet, in retrospect, uh, these are all nations that fell, uh, fell away and just kind of blew away like chaff, blew away like a cloud. There's very little left of them. So, For instance, in uh, verse 17, Okay, I see him, not now. I behold him, not near. A star shall come up out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. Well, that's what my translation says. That's New King James. Destroy all the sons of tumult. I'd be curious what your translations have. And the reason why I know that there's kind of variety there is because it's actually a really cryptic text. Like, you don't really know how to translate the Hebrew there. It's it's the sons of, I think it's like Set or Seat, something like that. And, and um, I think that that's probably referring to a nation, a, a, a tribe, or a, a, an ethnic group. Um, the closest they can come up with is a Hebrew word that means tumult. So, so that's how New King James is translating it. But they're really kind of grasping at straws there when they try to figure out what, who is this terrifying people that scared Israel. But now we have no clue who that is. They're, they're gone, and, 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 there's, and there's no other record of them. There's no other mention of them. They're just a blip, and they were gone. But they were terrifying at, at this particular moment. And it's true of the number of the other nations that are listed here. Uh, verse 18, And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also, his enemies, shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Who is Seir? Uh, there's, a, there's a Mount Seir that's south of the Dead Sea. Uh, we know of a mountain. We don't know of a people. We don't know of a, na a nation or anything like that. So maybe there was a nation there, and then and then the name got the mountain got named after them, or something like that. But we're we're just guessing because we don't know who these people are anymore. Um, Amalek, uh, we do know, is a longtime enemy of Israel. They're mentioned in verse twenty. They looked on Amalek, and he took up his oracle. Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Now, Amalek is, we know that Israel struggles with Amalek throughout uh, the Old Testament, but it's interesting, we only know of Amalek because of um, Israel's struggle with them. There's not any uh, real record of them outside of Scripture, not an archaeological record or anything um, like that. We know that the Kenites, verse 21, were maybe on the Sinai Peninsula, and I think Moses' uh, father-in-law comes from this uh, group, but that's kind of all that we know. Um, it's interesting how many of these are little blips and then gone, but they loomed so large at this moment such that it would be a great blessing to hear that you're going to be delivered from these scary neighbors. Now, both, um, both Moab in verse 17 and Edom in verse 18 are long-standing enemies of Israel with a significant archaeological record. You have, they show up in Egyptian texts, as well as there's the famous uh, Moabite stella, which is this like stone uh, uh, structure that with carvings about Moab and whatnot. So you do have uh, accounts of them. Uh, and remember that Balak, the guy who's um, hiring Balaam here, is the king of Moab. Moab is the nation that descended from Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughter. And they lived just on the east side of the Dead Sea. And they're a 
constant thorn in the side of Israel until the Persian Empire, and it's under the Persian Empire that the Moabites finally are kind of wiped out. And Edom, that's the one that's descended from Esau, they live just south of Moab on the, on the southern end of the Dead Sea. And while Israel defeated Edom multiple times, they continued as an enemy of Israel well into the first century. So you have two nations there that like, okay, I guess those were around for a while, but the bulk of them, the majority of them, are nations that, that just disappear. We really don't know anything about them. So Balaam, he sees all these nations in this vision, um, and he sees all of them fall in what he says will be in the latter day, as one from Israel rises and exercises dominion over them. And one thing that we should note uh, is that even though Balaam starts off talking about Israel, it's very clear that he's focusing on a single individual. He says in verse 17, I see him. And it doesn't say I see them, I see him. Uh, he sees a single man. And next we see that, that, um, that he knows that this, this, this man that he sees is not immediate. He really emphasizes, I, I, he says, I see him, but not now. I see him, but not near. He sees a, a single man who's going to come up out of Israel who is a long, long, long ways off who's at a great distance, a, 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 long, a long time later. But, so he's just seeing this one man very uh, dimly. He sees a single man, and yet he knows that he is distant. It's interesting, um, and, and remember, he, he introduced this prophecy to Balak by saying, I'm going to show you what will happen in the latter days. This is, this is going to be a while. In the latter days is when all this will unfold. Um, something very similar is said by uh, Jacob, um, when Jacob is on his deathbed at the very end of Genesis in, in, in chapter 49. Chapter 49, Jake, Jacob is about to die, verse 1. It says, Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. So Jacob has a prophecy. He, he's about to die. He's got his sons gathered together, and he's going to tell them what will happen to their tribes um, down the road. And he goes through each son, telling them a little something about what will happen with each of their tribes. But when he gets to Judah in verse 8, he says this, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people." It's really interesting, first of all, that he introduces this with the exact same words that Balaam is going to use to introduce his prophecy. I'm going to tell you about the latter days, what will happen in the latter days. And in the Hebrew, the, the phrase is identical. He's using the same way of introducing. I, I'm, I'm prophesying and telling you something that will happen down the road. And he singles out Judah, saying that um, in Judah, in the latter days, there will be a lion which is interesting because that's the image that Balaam in the previous three prophecies has, he keeps describing Israel as there's a lion. They're, they're a lion, and the lion that's going to destroy all of his enemies. Everybody else will be prey in front uh, of this lion. And he says, also, Judah, you, you have a scepter coming up from you, which is, again, what Balaam says, that there will be a scepter that will arise. Judah, or excuse me, Jacob and Balaam are, are both having visions of the same thing. This individual who rise up, specifically descended from Judah, who will be a lion, who will have a scepter, and who's, and Balaam adds, who will be announced by the coming of a star. It's interesting, you know, we just read in, we just recited this in the definition of Chalcedon. We're talking about Jesus, the only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of him, and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. The prophets from the earliest times have been looking forward and seeing the coming of the Messiah, the, the, the rise of the scepter, the lion, announced by this star. Okay, This is what Balaam has seen, only Balaam sees the coming of the scepter um, announced by the coming of a star. Now, both Pastor Sumter and myself have, been, have emphasized over the last few sermons that when, when Balaam, in these visions, he's looking at Israel, and, and we said that, that when he's looking at Israel, he's seeing Israel through the lens of his covenant, uh, the covenant that was made clear with Abraham, that when Balaam is looking at Israel, he, see, he describes Israel by the attributes of his covenant with, with Israel, uh, particularly when he says, I look at him and, and I don't see any iniquity in him. 
How, how is that possible if you're really looking at Israel that you don't see iniquity there? Well, it's only possible if God is looking at Israel through the, the lens of his covenant promise. It describes how he sees Israel as this fruitful, bountiful nation. And it, all the different elements of the Abrahamic covenant keep getting repeated in Balaam's vision and the way he looks at Israel. But what we see here is that while these blessings are all there for a nation, they're, they're, th this covenant is there for a nation, but this covenant is made possible by the coming of one single man who comes as the fulfillment of the covenant. Why can God look at Israel and see Israel like that? Because when he's looking at Israel, he's looking at Jesus. He, he's seeing our covenant head. He's seeing the one who was promised. He sees him and all who are in him experience covenantally this blessing, this promise that has been given, uh, given to Abraham but fulfilled in Jesus. Now, the Jews widely understood that a king was going to come as the fulfillment of all these promises. And as you come close to the, to the coming of the Messiah, the birth of Jesus, there is, there is a, um, you can feel the tension building in Israel. There is a knowledge that God has promised us that he would send us a king, and this king is going to deliver us from all of our enemies. And, and when he comes, everybody else will be cast down. I forgot to mention this in the previous um, uh, service, but, it, but at the end, when you have this, this description of ships that will come from Cyprus, uh, that's repeated again in Daniel, and it's usually understood to be either um, the Greeks uh, or the Romans. And in fact, in the Septuagint, I think that it, it specifically says ships from Rome. That's how they, they translate it. They understand this is the people that are occupying uh, Israel at the time of Christ. And so, so they know that there's the promise of a coming king who was going to rise up. And when he rises up, it's going to drive out all of these people that are oppressing us. And they can feel it coming. That's why they're waiting for the Messiah. I mean, when you read the accounts of the birth of Jesus, it's, it's interesting reading about all the different people who are sitting there in Jerusalem waiting for the Messiah because they know by these prophecies that it's coming. And it was understood that this prophecy in Numbers 24, this prophecy of Balaam, foretold the coming of a king who would be symbolized by a star. They knew that a star would announce the coming of the Messiah. And I'm emphasizing this because my, my point here is that this, this idea that Numbers 24 and the star here and the arrival of the star, this is not a um, Christian attempt to go back into the Old Testament and reinterpret an obscure text and make it have a Christian application. What I'm describing here was the widely understood Jewish application of this passage as they approached the coming of the Messiah. They knew that the star would rise and that would announce the coming of the Messiah. In, uh, I think it's around 150 BC, Alexander Janius, who's a, a king of Israel at this time, but from the line of the Maccabees, so we don't read about him in the Bible. But he, you know, he, he's a little bit insecure about whether he really has authority over this nation or not. And he puts out a coin, and on the coin on the back side is a big star. And the reason the star is there is because he wants to say, I'm this king. I'm the king that, that Numbers 24, that Balaam prophesied. I'm the star. Uh, he didn't do any of the things that this text ends up saying, and he's widely uh, dismissed and forgotten. And what's interesting is after the coming of Jesus, now you, you all know of in 70 AD, um, uh, Israel attempts to like revolt against Rome, and the, and the Romans come. It starts in 68, and then it culminates in 70 AD when they finally overthrow this, this revolution, and the, the temple in Jerusalem is burned, um, and, and the temple is not rebuilt. But a lot of people don't know that for the next 60 years, there's a real belief within the Jews that they're still going to rise up. They're still going to come back, and they're going to drive out the Romans. And in the year 130 AD, there was a second revolt against Rome that's called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And if you're a history nerd, then you know that this one was one of the most gruesome um, and devastating sort of destructions of Israel that you could imagine. The, the Romans were so sick of Israel revolting against them that when they crushed Bar Kokhba, they, they just burned everything and, and leveled 
everything. They made it illegal for a Jew to re-enter Jerusalem. You can't even go to that city anymore because we don't want you thinking that you're rebuilding this temple. They, they renamed Israel Palestine. Palestine is named after the Philistines. They renamed the promised land Palestine because they wanted to, to wipe out the name of Israel. You're not allowed to have any of it anymore. The guy who led this rebellion that Rome crushed was a guy uh, named Bar Kokhba, although Bar Kokhba was his nickname. It wasn't his actual name. It was a nickname given to him by Rabbi Akiva. And Bar Kokhba is from the word kokav, the Hebrew word kokav, which means star. And, and Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, when he saw this revolution starting, he wanted to kind of get everybody excited about it. And he said, this guy, Bar Kokhba, he is the fulfillment of Numbers 24. He's the star that Balaam has promised us, and we need to all get behind him and follow him. Uh, it also failed miserably. Everybody died, and, um, and they flattened everything. And it's at this point that actually the Jews, they, the, the rabbis that were left, relocated to the city called Javna in 130 AD, and that's where they reinvented Judaism, realizing that they weren't ever getting a temple back. And so they had to come up with a new way of being Jewish. And this is where the Mishnah is born. And what we think of as Judaism now was invented there between 130 and 200 AD in Javna. Because they, they don't, Judaism has a temple, and they weren't going to have a temple. So they had to make up a, basically a new religion. And that's what Judaism is now, this reinvented uh, religion after the crushing of Bar Kokhba and the realization that this is not your star. He's not going to save you. But between these two, Alexander Janius and Bar Kokhba, comes the one who actually was, was announced. His coming was announced by the coming of the star. The actual lion of the tribe of Judah, the actual scepter in Israel, comes with the birth of Christ, announced to the world by the coming of the star. This star found its fulfillment in the announcement to the Magi at the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and the use of a star to picture the Messiah is so striking. I mean, what a, what a fantastic image to announce uh, the coming of the Son of God. Um, we, we all know that when you look at a star, you, you see a small pe- speck of what actually is, right? We, we know you see just this little dot in the sky, but, it, but that, that um, if you were actually to go and see it as it is, it's something enormous. It's something uh, terrifying. Each star is a sun to itself, right? And if you were near it, you could not look directly at it without being blinded. And if you were nearer than that, you would be consumed by its presence because it is so magnificent. Each star has a life and a power totally different than ours and almost unfathomable uh, to us. They, but they look just like distant specks in our vision. Um, dis- distant and forgettable little specks that you could easily dismiss. And so I think there's like a, there's like a battle of perspective here. Uh, what I mean is this. How significant are the stars in your life, right? Um, they're at most little blips that you maybe occasionally like have an aesthetic moment with when you go camping, right? Every now and then you're reminded of the existence of stars. If you live in a big city, you can literally go years on end without noticing the stars. They're, they're drowned out by the lights of the city. And then you go out into the mountains at night and you suddenly are reminded of their existence. But even then, it's just like kind of a little aesthetic moment. It's like getting to see a, sun, a sunset or something like that. But look objectively at the universe. Look objectively at the universe and yourself in it, okay? And, and now ask, how significant are you compared to those stars? <laughs> you, you are a little smudge, you know, compared to the glory of one of those stars. Compared to them in their size, in their splendor, in their power, in their heat, in their brightness, you are a little, you are the speck, not the star. And and I think this is, um, this is why I say a star is such a perfect way to announce the coming of Jesus. Ignored by many as an insignificant part of their lives, when in actuality they are the ones who are dwarfed by its significance and glory. The announcement of the coming of the Son is so much larger than each of us that, that you can go right past it without hardly noticing it, but we are the speck in compared, uh, comparison to it. A star will rise, Balaam says. Um, (coughs) 
excuse me, he says, a star will rise and it is far off. It's distant. Um, it, it's, it's a speck in the night sky. It's at such a great distance. And yet, the, the rising of that star is the most significant point in these four prophecies. It's the thing that, it, that, that is the powerful announcement in all of them. And you can imagine somebody that's sitting there at the time saying, no, it's the Kenites. You know, that's the terrifying thing. Or no, it's the sons of tumult or whatever that nation is. Those are the scary people. Those are the pressing problem. You can imagine being in the story in any number of these nations that's described surrounding Israel. Those seem like the terrifying and large thing. But the star is by far the most, more significant than all the other nations that are listed here. Now, it's... it's um, <clears throat> It's easy to say this in retrospect, right? Like it's always, it's always handy when you're like at 2,000 years removed from the event to then extract the moral that clearly everybody else should have, should have seen. It's, it's always easy at a great distance to kind of uh, make that kind of interpretation, to see it in retrospect. Um, but, but real wisdom, real wisdom is the ability to see ahead of time what others can only see in retrospect. Right? When, when you can look at the situation around you and what others can only see with the, the, the 2020 hindsight, when you can see it when it's unfolding in front of you, that's what real wisdom is. And, and learning to see your world now through the lesson learned from this prophecy, that's what real wisdom looks like. So, so then you have to ask yourself, so what are the sons of tumult in your life right now? What are, the, what are the, the pressing nations around you now that seem to loom so large? What, what looms large in your life? Think about just ask that question for a moment. What looms large in your, wife, in your life? And, and an easy way to tell is when everything goes quiet, what occupies your mind? What, what do, where does your mind go? Where do you start thinking and plotting and imagining and trying to work through that or worrying and stressing out as you think about that looming thing? Maybe it's when you wake up in the morning and, and you're, you know, you're still pretending that you're not awake and you're laying there with your eyes closed trying to not let the day actually start. And then that thought comes into your mind and you start working through that. Or maybe it's at night after everything is dark, everything is quiet, and you're laying on your bed waiting for sleep to take you away, but you can't help but have your mind go there as you work through it again and again. Maybe it's when you're on a drive by yourself and your mind is working on this. What is the sun of tumult that is always coming in that you are wrestling with? Um, what is it that creeps into your mind and occupies all of your thoughts? Think about what it is and name it. Name it to yourself. Name it for a moment um, <coughs> clearly to yourself. And then ask yourself this. Whatever this thought is, does it know its importance relative to Jesus? Do you know its objective relative importance in relationship to Christ? Um, does, does, it, does this um, stress, does this worry, does this problem, does it know that a star is rising? Have you told this problem about the star that is rising, that is so much larger than it? Does it know its actual size versus that of the star that is rising? And guess which one in the end will remain? The, the star or the sons of tumult? Right? We, we know that the sons of tumult will fade away, will blow away, will wither and blow away, and that star will rise, and that star will grow, and that's what is going to remain. And the great thing about a star is that um, despite its great distance, it is the premier fixed point in the night sky by which everyone can orient themselves, right? For, for how many centuries do, have we both figured out our place in space and in time based on the stars, right? It is, it, is, it is the perfect orientation point for all of your life, letting you know where you are in both space and time. That's what a star does. We navigate both space and time by the stars. And whatever that tumult is, the star is actually your path through that tumult. It's the thing that leads you through whatever that stress is. And you have to sit and picture this for a moment because it's such a really um, incredible parallel that, that God manages to set up for us with this story. Because think about this for a moment. Balaam 
we're told was a sorcerer, and he, and he comes from the east. He, he comes from the east. We're not totally clear exactly where it is he comes from, but he, he, he comes from the east. Balaam shows up, and he's a sorcerer. Um, he, we, we're told that he's attempting to use sorcery against Israel. And he comes um, to Balak, who is a Moabite king, a king in, in the nation, in the area that will be the promised land of Canaan. But, but he, is, um, he is a king reigning in this area. And, and, um, and, he is, and he has Balaam come and he gives them news of a star. And the star announces the coming of a king. And the coming of the king announces Balak's own doom. Okay, So that's what has happened here. Well, fast forward about 1,600 years or so to the very first Christmas. And what is it that happens? The Magi arrive in the court of Herod the Great. The Magi have this long, they're, they're kind of like this long mystical line that are in Persia. If you're an NSA student and you get to read your Herodotus, you'll find out all about the story of the Magi. And they're this mystical kind of line within Persia that are known for well, they're being mystical. Uh, they are um, sorcerers, I suppose. Our word magic actually is just from the word magi. That's where we get the word magic from them because that was a power that they were supposed to have. So magicians, it all uh, derives back ultimately from the magi in, in Persia. So the Magi are actually like a really close parallel to Balaam in this story. They're these magicians. They, they, they come from the east and they show up in the court of this king. And Herod the Great is, he's the king in Israel, but what's interesting about Herod the Great is he's not an Israelite. Herod the Great is not a Jew. He was given the throne over Israel by Rome, but Herod the Great was actually an Edomite which is interesting because we have the Moabites and the Edomites are the two nations that, that, um, that are listed here that actually make it uh, some, some bit of time. But the Edomites are one of the nations that are listed here in Balaam's prophecy. Uh, so Herod the Great is an Edomite king who has the Magi, these magicians from the east, show up, and the mag magicians from the east announce that a star is, has come up, and the star announces the king of Israel, all right? And, and Herod knows right away that he's in trouble. That's why he sends them out to go and try to kill all of the babies. The, the, the conversation then between Balak and Balaam uh, closely parallels the conversation between the Magi and Herod. It's the same thing that's, that's going on there. Both Balak and Herod hear about the rising star, the rising king, and they see their own kingdom threatened by it. The rise of the star of the Messiah then announces a threat to all of the surrounding kingdoms. And this is a threat to all competing kings. But it's important to notice that when Balaam sees a star, he emphasizes that what he sees is a long ways away. Balaam says, I'm seeing something, but it's a long ways away, just as Jacob saw something a long ways away. But it's something that then finds its actual fulfillment in the coming of Christ. That's the real true fulfillment of it. But that means then, if the true fulfillment of it is then the coming of Christ, that means that the overthrow of the nations that surrounded uh, uh, Balak, uh, the overthrow of those nations which were immediately around Israel, prefigured or maybe were only a preliminary fulfillment to the real, true, and ultimate fulfillment, which is the conquest that comes with the coming of Christ. So, so when Balaam is sitting there and seeing this king that's going to conquer, the conquest that he sees is actually the conquest of Jesus Christ. It's only prefigured in the conquest of the nations around Israel, or it only has a, a preliminary or initial fulfillment there. The real true conquest is the conquest that comes when Jesus comes. This is a victory that is ultimately fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ and his victory through his death and resurrection, his victory over sin, death, and the devil. And this is the conquest that this prophecy is pointing towards. Right? That's the real conquest that Balaam is seeing. And this means then, if you think about it, that this victory that is prophesied here in Numbers 24 includes in it a prophecy of Jesus' victory over sin, death, and the devil in your life. It, it actually is something that is playing out in your personal life. Jesus' victory over sin, death, and the devil in your life is being prophesied right here. All the little petty battles that are going on in your heart, all the little petty kingdoms that are fighting for the loyalty of your heart, right? Balaam is seeing, prophesying their defeat in the coming of the Messiah and the enthroning of the Messiah. 
Their defeat at the hands of the Messiah is foretold by the rising of this star. And because the truth is that when the star goes up in your heart, okay, when the star goes into your heart, you have lots of competing desires. When the, when the king shows up in your heart, there are lots of Balaks and Herods that don't much care for the announcement that the king is there. You have little things in your heart that are wrestling with that. Christ, however, claims all of your heart. He is the lion. He is the scepter. He is going to destroy all of his enemies. And the competing desires in your heart are enemies to him. And we've been pro it's been prophesied by Balaam, they're going to fall. They're going to die because Christ is the lion who's going to defeat all of his opponents. So Christ claims all of your heart, all of Christ for all of life, for all of your individual hearts. And your heart hears this, and then your heart has a tendency to go in search of a Balaam to try and counter this claim. Can I hire you to do something about this exclusive claim of Christ on my life? Right? Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace, but you kind of want a Prince of Panic to also have room somewhere in your heart. Or, or Christmas comes as a holiday of gift giving, which is really appropriate if you think about the Magi showing up with their gifts for baby Jesus. And so we celebrate Christmas with gift giving. But there's, there's nothing like a holiday like Christmas and gift giving to fill your heart with envy and resentment for all the little petty tyrants to pop up in your heart and compete with your loyalty. And it, it isn't just the gift giving that sparks that. When you're like seven, I think that, you know, you unwrap your present, your sister unwraps her present next to you, and then you start comparing, and obviously all the sin starts to come in. But then you get, you get older than that. You, you get older than that, and that's not nearly as powerful of a temptation anymore. You get older than that, and what we find is that at a time like this, at Christmas time, this is, this is that time where you have to go and, I say have to, you get to. You get to go to all of these Christmas parties and family gatherings and whatnot. But the truth is there's a little bit of have to in there as well, right? There is, there, there is a little bit because what you find is that over the course of the year, there are a lot of people that you don't naturally go and spend time with because you have a problem with them. And yet when you hit Christmas time, a holiday like this, you have certain um, guest lists that are kind of required of you. And so you're going to spend, pe you're going to spend time with people that you don't normally choose for yourself to associate with because you have resentments. You have jealousies. You have um, bitterness that, that makes this a difficult room to be in, makes this a different com difficult conversation for you to be a part of. You have, it is likely that you have a real grudge against some of the people that you'll be fellowshipping, fellowshipping with over this holiday. Any other invitation to spend time with them, you might come up with a convenient excuse to miss. But at Christmas, you have to actually show up and spend time with them. And the grudge is going to resurface in your heart. And you need to think about this as just a playing out of what Balaam and Balak are going through right here. Christ claims your heart, all right? And, and you're supposed, it's supposed to be given to him. A temptation is going to come in, a temptation to be resentful, a temptation to be bitter, a temptation to be jealous, envious, whatever it is. That temptation is going to come in, and you need to see it as a son of tumult, as a little petty tyrant who's trying to claim something that's not his, that you, you're not going to allow because Christ reigns in your heart. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, bitterness, envy, resentment, jealousy. It doesn't matter what it is because there is this star on the horizon. And that star announces the coming of a king who is in direct competition with that sin. All right? And not only that, that king's victory over that sin is announced by the rising sun. All right? that, or excuse me, that rising star. Christ's victory is announced by that rising star. If you look at 2 Peter I think Peter actually makes a little bit of an application of this to us. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The morning star rises in your hearts. All right, that's the promise that we have, that this star is rising, will rise in your hearts, and it's not, gonna, it's not going to allow any competition.
Um, the, the star rises, it announces the coming of a king who's in direct competition with that sin, and that king's victory over that sin is guaranteed by the rising of that star. So think of each of these temptations like another little petty king of Moab or Edom. Point these sins towards the star that is rising and say, too bad, you lose, Jesus wins, and get out of my heart. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we know that in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth, and on the fourth day of creation you created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And you said that these were given to us for signs and for seasons. And here we are now in this season of Advent, announced by the sign of this star. So we thank you for the star of Bethlehem. We thank you for the announcement of the coming of your Son, our Messiah, our King, our Savior, and our Lord. And we thank you that built into this announcement of his coming is the promise of his victory. May this glorious promise be at the center of all of our Christmas celebrations. And so we pray now, as your son taught us to pray, saying, One of the things that weekly communion proclaims is that this world was made so that we might know God. If God's pleased to minister uniquely through this ordinary bread and wine, he's also pleased to minister to us through all his gifts. If he's uniquely present here at this table, and he is, then he is also present at all our tables, all the time. God did not create the world to be a distraction from him. God created the world so that we might know him and walk with him in it. This world is the place where God determined to reveal himself to us, to dwell with us. Every rock, every star, every animal, Every drop of water, every color, every taste and sound, they were all made by Jesus. And Jesus made it all so that we might know him, so that we might be in fellowship with him through it all. The Westminster Shorter Catechism famously says that the chief end of man, what we were made for most of all, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. How do we do that? by glorifying God and enjoying him in all his gifts. The central gift is himself in Jesus Christ. And he gives us that gift here every week as we believe in him, as we rest in him. But this table is training for the whole world. What is on this table? Ordinary bread, ordinary wine. And what's it for? It's the gift of God that you might taste and see the love of God in Jesus the grace of God in Jesus, the mercy and kindness of God in Jesus. Christ himself is here. Now as you go, look for Christ everywhere. Beginning right now, look at the people sitting next to you. Do you see Christ in them? Do they belong to Jesus? Then he dwells in them and he is everywhere. He did not make this world to hide from you. He made this world so that you might find him everywhere. And as you give gifts and hang lights and bake cookies and sing carols, see him there, hear him there, taste him there. He is good. Of course, you should not give beyond your means, but neither should you feel bad for generous, lavish gifts. Christ is a generous, lavish gift. And when you give generously, you are giving him. He is here. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. It's pretty amazing to think about Balaam some 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, seeing the, the conquering star today. I mean, that, I mean that's, what, that's what he was seeing. He was seeing the star rising, the scepter rising, Jesus, he's born. But the whole prophecy is that he rises to scatter his enemies, to scatter all his enemies. So there's still enemies, the enemies around us, the enemies in our heart. That's what Balaam saw. He saw that victory. He saw that king coming, and he has come, and he is reigning until all of his enemies have been put beneath his feet. The two charges of one is, you heard it first of all, just a charge to resist temptation. Don't even give room to temptation this week. Why? Because Christ is king. He is a star. He's risen in the east. His, his kingdom is so much greater than any other little petty tyrant can offer you. Right? It, just compare it. How big's the star? How big's this temptation? It's nothing. Don't give, don't give room to it. And then if you do, 
If, if you give in, you have a bad attitude, get cranky. You know how to kill that enemy? Confess it. Confess it to God. Confess it to anybody you've sinned against. Make it right. It, that's how you put to death sin in your life. Put it to death. Conquer it. Because Jesus has won. Because Jesus has come. And go with his blessing to do these things. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And amen.